So my dear brother Usman Bakar, Ahmed Badri, Abdullah, Muhammad Fawzan, so, and then uh, Professor Muhammad Azam, Muhammad Adil, and then Tansri, Sidi Muhammad As Hassan. You know, listening to the introduction, I almost felt that you have introduced the wrong person. Um, I don't deserve this kind of uh, uh, compliments and not that I'm just a simple uh, worker. And I often say, someone went to buy a parrot and went to a shop and asked, how much is this parrot? Somebody said it's 50 ringgit. When the next parrot, so what this parrot does, this parrot uh, knows uh, keyboarding. So he goes to the next parrot and says, how much is this one? It's a 200 ringgit. What this parrot does, it knows uh, programming. And then you go third parrot, it's 1,000 ringgit. So they asked, what does he do? So the answer was, this parrot doesn't do anything. But the other two parrots call him boss. So I'm just one of those expensive parrot. I don't do much, uh, but somehow, for some reason, some brothers give me some credit. Uh, talking about uh, uh, Madani uh, society, I'm still learning. This is my third day here. So it calls for sustainability, care and compassion, respect, innovation, prosperity, uh, and trust. Uh, interestingly, the book I wrote, Five Pillars of Prosperity, in 2014, uh, contains all these uh, you know, nice words. So the book, Five Pillars of Prosperity, uh, first pillar is uh, earnings, uh, second pillar is savings, third is investments, and fourth is planned spending, because I don't have to tell anyone how to spend money. They already know that. And the last pillar is giving, uh, which is very crucial to me, uh, especially the pillar of zakat. I'm very passionate about it, and I can talk hours and hours on that, that topic. So I written actually, when I wrote the book, I have four pillars, and I kept on thinking if I can think of another pillar, uh, then it will rhyme with five pillars of Islam, five pillars of hip hop, and whatnot. So we were at Umrah, I'm going from uh, Kaaba to after Asr prayer to the hotel, and it just hit on me, uh, you know, first pillar or the fifth pillar should be earnings. Because if you don't earn, you cannot save, and if you don't save, you cannot invest. And if you don't invest, you can't spend, and then you cannot give. So then I start writing uh, something about earnings. Uh, you know, more I research on that, it really, uh, it's almost uh, mandatory that each one of us should uh, work hard and, and, and earn. And there are so many hadiths of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, which tells you that the hand which gives is better than the hand which receives. And, you know, so I think it's very crucial to be on our own. Then um, most of uh, uh, Professor Sallam himself was a trader, was a businessman. And if you go back and look in, uh, in the history, uh, even in the, in the Bible, uh, we find that most of the apostles, uh, they were uh, business people. Uh, even uh, Imam Hanafi, uh, you know, used to go out and give uh, golden coins and so on and so forth. Um, so, so really, earning is, is very, very crucial. We are highly encouraged. Uh, our, one of our uh, Sahaba, uh, Afan, you know, he uh, told someone in Medina, just show me where the market is, and then it's all up to me. And alhamdulillah, he became one of the richest person in history, and he contributed a lot to, uh, to the Islamic work. Now, once you make money, most of us, we know how to spend. And a lot of our, uh, my uh, colleagues, including myself to some extent, we live paycheck to paycheck. And we earn enough, but we spend enough. Uh, that's not, in my mind, is a way of living. So savings are uh, very, very crucial. 
And Hadith of Prophet ﷺ that even if we are at the river, when we make wudu, we should be conservative in using water. And you ask, you know, if I'm at the river, oh, oh, is there so much water there, why I have to be conservative? Uh, just because that's the, the habit. So please make savings a habit. Um, you know, I am very stingy in many things. Uh, when I use a tissue paper, um, if you come to my office, you will see half of the napkin or tissue paper sitting on my desk. Uh, and when I use uh, one, I don't need to use the whole thing. I just tear it up into half and use the other half and leave the other half for, for later. Uh, my book, uh, Five Pillars in Prosperity, is free. It's available online. You can download it on the CICW website. Uh, it's not written to make money. It is more to help our community. So, so it, there are many examples I have given, uh, which you know you might say, you know, gosh, you really are a stingy person. I take the blame. No problem. Uh, my father. You know, was uh, a great uh, entrepreneur. May Allah be pleased with him. And I learned from him how to take care of trust money and how to economize. You know, when we receive mail, he used to cut the envelopes all around and turn them over and use them as scrap papers. So if you take the envelope, uh, cut around, turn it around, and this scrap paper. Uh, one of our business use was in. Uh, uh, bicycles. We used to sell bicycles. And bicycles use uh, tubes uh, for air. And some will go bad over time. So we used to cut them to make rubber bands. And, you know, so on and so forth. So it, I, I just acquired that uh, know-how that how you can make use of uh, your resources and multiply them. Uh, that is my motto. That's what has become uh, a way of life. And savings never hurts you. Now, if you adopt the policy of savings, uh, you can never go wrong. Uh, whether you run a business or a nonprofit or any organization or, or, the, or a household or a family, because then you can maximize the use of that, those resources. In my book, uh, you know, uh, Franklin has said, penny saved or ringer saved is ringer earned. I disagree with that because when you earn one ringer, uh, there is something called income tax. And once you take the income tax out, uh, you may end up with 70 uh, pesa or whatever ring or whatever the term is, or 80. So, in my calculation, you have to, if you earn 1.5 ringer, you end up with one ringgit. And so when you save one ringgit, you should reward yourself as you have earned 1.5 ringgit. So every time when you spend, you know, uh, think about it, you know, you are spending one ringgit, but really it means 1.5 ringgit. So in business, if I save one ringgit on the cost, as if my revenues have gone up by 1.5 ringgit. So really, if you adopt that, that approach, um, you know, you can uh, never lose money in, in, in the business. So most of the businesses I oversee and manage, um, that's our principle, cut cost. And because if you cut cost, you will be better business than the other businesses. And you can compete, you can make more money. And we have reached a level where we make money, but other people are losing money because our cost is down, the cost is low. So savings and cost cutting is really uh, my middle name, so to speak. So once you have enough savings, uh, then you have to look for investments. And how can I optimize the few ringers I have in my pocket? And in my book on page 39, I give an example how investments, uh, if you start early, you will have a lot more money than you start late. And the example is uh, talking about three people. Uh, someone was age 14 and started investing $2,000 or 2,000 ringgit uh, each year and stopped after five years. So total investment is $10,000. 
And the other person started at year number uh, 15, 16, and then went on to some number. The person who started early and only invested $10,000 end up a lot more money when at retirement than the people who started late. So the lesson is uh, start early investing and invest on a regular basis as much as, as, you, as you can. So then the question comes where to invest. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we have now Islamic uh, mutual funds, uh, Mana mutual fund, which we started in 1986 with $100,000. And uh, now we have become the world largest Islamic mutual fund with $5.5 billion in investments. And uh, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, I'm chairman of the board. I'm very happy that this vehicle has given lots of profits to our people. We have five-star rating, and uh, it's best performing fund uh, in the country. So many lessons you can draw on it. One is that if we do things right, Islamically right, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses them. You know, just think about it. If I invest in something which is uh, not kosher, not uh, acceptable, or I don't want to say haram, but it's makru. Then why we think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless that investment? He's not going to encourage us to go invest in wineries or tobacco or in casinos and then pray that this investment will be okay. Why, why should he bless that investment? Yeah. So we, we need to find investments which are Islamically accepted and we feel comfortable that, you know, we are doing it. When we do, do things right and we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then those investments will be rewarded. And that has been uh, my experience, that has been my life, and I can testify to that fact. If we do things right, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to reward you. Very quickly, you know, I don't want to brag, but in 1986 we started with almost no money. And we raised some money, we invested it. In 1995, we had $10 million endowment. And a lot of hard work, uh, but some delight happened. Then we said, now we don't want to beg anymore. We want to focus on the work. And we kept on uh, working. As of December 2017, that endowment grew to $350 million. And that is after spending uh, the money which was needed for the, uh, for the work conferences, seminars, and salaries, and whatever. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, that's about investments. So let me repeat, invest early, invest regularly, and you will have, inshallah, a lot of money uh, at the end. Now, control spending. Uh, I often tell people, I don't have to tell you how to spend money. You know, I already know. Maybe you know better than me. But in my book, what I argue, that we should plan to spend. And we should have controlled spending. So what does that mean? If I want to uh, buy a car, let's say a Proton, and it's $20,000, uh, I don't know what the price is, but let's say it's $20,000, uh, I want to buy it and I don't want to borrow it, I don't want to finance it, I want to own it. So my book, uh, I have given formulas how you can save and invest money that after four years or five years, depending on your time horizon, um, you put in the money and you will have 20,000 uh, ringers to go or $20,000 to buy a proton. And somebody agrees to marry you, that's a blessing. Uh, but banks don't, you know, trust young couples. Uh, so you have to save money for it. You don't want to become a burden to your parents. Uh, and so on and so forth. The last category is giving. Uh, so I'm very, very passionate about it. Uh, pillar of Zakah, uh, to me, is a, is a great pillar. Uh, it's trying to bring kind of equality among people uh, trying to help the people who are not that fortunate, trying to bring them to a decent level of living. And, you know, it's, it's, it's just beautiful. 
looking at the categories of zakah, which are in Quran for eight uh, categories, we just usually look at poor and the needy, and we just stop there. Uh, there are six more categories uh, which are equally important. Of course, we are given no guidance which one is more important than the others, but there are six more categories. Uh, one of the categories is pay the people who are collectors of zakah. Uh, I don't know about here, so uh, forgive me because I'm not that familiar with Malay culture, although I've been visiting it for a long time. But in states, I'm not aware of any Islamic center who have hired full-time people to go and collect zakah. Whereas Quran allows us, but we don't, we don't, we have not done it. Then one of the categories is that we relieve people from debt. All right. Now, how do I know that a brother or a sister is under debt? Uh, nobody's going to come to me and say, well, I have a great news. I got $10,000 debt. Uh, give me your zakah so I can pay out my debt. It's not going to happen. And we should not allow that to happen because people have dignity and respect. And, um, you know, we don't want them to lower to that level. So what does, it, what does it mean? How do we find out? To me, what it means, that we should be involved in the community and we should be so close to each other that we will know their inner feelings or inner uh, information that this person is under, under stress and we need to do something about it, you see? So there's so many, you know, uh, one of the purposes of Zakah is to eliminate uh, poverty. And people come to me and say, well, we still have poverty, so what, what is the problem? And I know, in the, historically, it has happened that in almost time, uh, people had zakah in their pockets, and they couldn't find anyone who deserves zakah. And if that happened at that time, it should happen now. Someone might say, now we should say that, but someone might say, well, two and a half percent, five percent, this is not enough to solve the problem of poverty. We cannot say that because Allah SWT knew that these percentages are enough to create a just society and have people who are you know, decently living. So where is the problem then? So in my mind, and I'm subject to suggestions and corrections from you, we need to educate people, teach people how to properly calculate zakah and then properly distribute it. And my wife is involved in social work in, in Virginia. She raises about $2 million each year, helping poor and the needy and domestic violence and people lost jobs and medical emergencies, uh, old people. And I asked her, you know, if you have $20 million, what will you do? She said, I will change the face of this, uh, this town. There will, won't, won't be any uh, poor person. So why I, I multiplied by 10? Looking at our own community uh, where we live, we have beautiful mosque, Adam Center, um, where we have maybe 2,000 families. Uh, we have three Juma prayers because we cannot accommodate uh, so many people in, in that building. And I made an estimate that on the average, if family earns this much, uh, how much money will be collected, and I calculated the zakah. So I came up with a, with a number which was 10 times more uh, zakah should be collected than what we collect in the, in the Islamic center. Now, I understand some people may not give to the center to distribute, they may send it back home. They, so I'm subject to all those corrections. Generally, I feel that we are collecting or contributing 10% of what we should be uh, doing. Uh, so education is needed. People, we need to remind each other to contribute, to collect, and do that. So, uh, so zakah is really uh, a pillar. I participated in the United Nations uh, seminar. How can we use zakah to eliminate poverty and, and illiteracy in Africa? Uh, there's a Hindu who wrote a book uh, on that he created a zakah as a virtual foundation. So there's no foundation, but if all of us together as a Muslim Ummah contribute, we have a virtual foundation which will have billions of dollars uh, in it. 
So that's uh, that's uh, now comes to, uh, to to giving. Uh, again, you know, there are so many ways you can give, so many ways you can you can um, dispose of of zakat. I want to tell you one little story. There was uh, a very rich person, Captain Levy, in uh, Philadelphia, and he was very generous. He used to give out, you know, a lot of money. And one day somebody asked him, "Look, you give out so much money, but then you still have so much. So what's the secret?" So he told him, "My secret is that I shovel money out. God shovels it back, but His shovel is a lot bigger than mine." So obviously, God's shovel is much bigger than than any one of us. So really, we should never think of what we give out is not going to. It's, it's a loss. It's not a loss. If you come to my office, beside half a napkin, you will see. I have three things on the back door which remind me all the time. Uh, one is name of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So we know the mercy, rahman, rahim, uh, all those names. The other one is uh, people plan. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala plan for you, but that plans are better. So I don't worry about what people are cooking and planning and all this. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala has a plan. That's what is my kadar. That's what I'm going to work for, and it's better for me. And the last one is whatever you give out, Allah replaces it. And if you follow those those things, then you know uh, you never will have a shortage. When I was doing the research for my book, I found one hadith which really changed my uh, perspective, and that is that one dirham given at the lifetime is better than hundred dirham given upon death. So I asked the question, you know, what's so good about giving upon death? And you lose hundred times the other. Why would we wait? To give until death, who cares? I mean, if I die, somebody you know give it away or squander it. It doesn't help me anymore. So I am strong believer of giving while living, and that's really what I want you to do. Uh, there's no virtue of living upon death. I mean, there is no requirement in my mind, and my ustad here to, uh, can correct me that we have to leave inheritance. Verses in Quran which talks about distribution of inheritance applies upon that. If you have an inheritance, you have nothing to distribute. You don't have to worry about any of those things. So I have chosen to, you know, do whatever khair you can do while you're living. There are a lot of benefits. Let's say I put in my will. We are prepared to give away one third. Uh, you know, help. Uh, IAIS or IIUM uh, endowments, whatever, and these institutions they get the money, but they don't do what they promised me to do. What can I do? I'm I'm gone. But if I give them while I'm living, I can check on them. I can ask them, well, show me what you did with my money. Give me a report. You have the ability to direct or redirect your contributions. There are lots of lots of poor people, lots of students, talented students, who cannot go to college just because of money. I was at Yusum, and they were telling me how many uh, students they have. Uh, they cannot afford to go to school, and they were asking, "What what can we do?" Abdul Hamid Abu Suleiman, my mentor, my dear brother, have created an endowment at IUM to help the foreign students. So. Why do we deny that uh, that education to them now? So let's say we all put in our wills that you know give scholarship to poor students uh, in IUM or in, in the USM or whatever. So what I have done? Those poor people who cannot get education, they are going to sit together and they are going to pray for my death. So when is he going to die? So we can get the money and we can buy the food or go to education. Do I want to do that? I want people to pray for my health, not that you know go away so we can get the money. So there's no incentive. I don't know why people would leave anything uh, to be distributed upon death. 
and we hope and we pray that our children are as responsible as we are being more responsible than we are but you never know um, instead of getting MBA they might go and buy BMW uh, so really giving while living is such a beautiful thing to me because if you help a student gets a degree you feel satisfaction he gets a job he comes to you and say look your help I'm able to stand on my feet so why should I delay that Allah knows how long I will live uh, that until that time that this will this will happen so really my request to all of you is that uh, work hard earn as much as you can halal learning save as much as you can when I was a student uh, I used to get $313 uh, from state of Texas because I was a research assistant and I used to spend $110 out of it and save about $200 a month and by the time I finished my PhD I had $10,000 in my pocket and I was very happy about it as I said now we talk talking about 1970 uh, imagine 10,000 means what so I did a calculation if you invest that money um, Islamically and otherwise that should be by now after 50 years uh, around about two million dollars who doesn't want to have two million dollars you know so so really this was my habit that's what I did that's what I learned from my by my parents uh, I spoke too much I love to answer questions and uh, there is a little bit more in my in my book but you know maybe we can uh, defer that so having your wills having your trust uh, your financial affairs in order is, is very very crucial and uh, you know you should really uh, focus on uh, on Madhi society which is just uh, fair is sustainable uh, you know your savings can be invested and could provide sustainability uh, to your children your two relatives you know so on so forth so I'll stop here and if there are any questions I'll be happy to entertain them